First tonight, a long-running battle in the smallest county. The gloves are off between one group of councillors who say they're being kept in the dark about decisions and the ruling administration who are threatening legal action, claiming harassment. Tony Rowe has been to Rutland to find out what's going on. Rutland, officially the happiest place to live in England. But there is bitterness here. Accusations over planning applications, accusations of a black hole in the budget, counterclaims of harassment, the calling in of the police. On one side are the ruling councillors, in the middle, the chief executive, and on the outside are the rebel councillors, the accusers. This, to me, is the last chance saloon. Please, gentlemen, think about it. Threats. Threats that uh, we shouldn't be asking these questions. Threats that we shouldn't be going about our business as councillors. And now threats that are effectively coming from the police. When the law gets involved, the police in particular, that adds a nasty element to any form of debate, which will only, do, which will only ratchet up. Um, the tension. This is one of the reasons why the rebels are asking questions. The construction of a mansion on the shores of Rutland Water without the need to go to the planning committee. Yeah, good old days have gone, haven't they? The farmer who used to own the land here wasn't allowed to build a bungalow on the site. You never meet anybody that doesn't comment on how, well, how did they get planning for that massive great building. It's in open countryside, it's just ridiculous. I can understand Mr Wankley's point, and often with planning it's difficult to understand as policies move on over the years. This one goes back over 40 years. In the 60s, Henry Wakeley's father farmed and lived in the valley below Hambleton. But then came rotten water. The farm was flooded. The Wakeleys were allowed to build two houses further up the hill, but could only afford one at the time. When they had the money, permission was refused, repeatedly. Mr Wakeley gave up. He sold the land for a million and in disbelief saw planning approval granted to the new owner who sold before building anything. But the next owner then put up a house on a much bigger plot, complete with annex without the need of going to a planning committee. I resent it, really. I mean, you know, if it was a, just a normal sized house, it wasn't so bad, but not the far as a house down. and sort of build a, a sensible house, but, I mean, when you build two in exactly the same position that I was refused, it just doesn't make sense. As the years roll by, people continue to say, how was that approved when something very small was refused? How is it that all the reasons that uh, were given to refuse that application have been totally ignored? And how is this approved under delegated powers? Planning policy, it seems, changed, no longer classifying the land as farmland. So the mansion was approved. This was never going to be one that needed to go to the planning committee because there was not a major local concern raised about it. It was delegated authority, which means that officers make a decision, but they check with the chairman of the planning committee, and the chairman of the planning committee hadn't got a concern. He checked with me as ward member. I hadn't had loads of local concerns on it, so it went through under delegated. Lots of applications of a similar nature would go through under delegated unless there was lots of local public concern. The next concern for the rebels, the sale of the park school site in Oakham. They wanted to know how it could be that it was on the open market only hours after full council had discussed it. Lo and behold, the next day, a huge for sale sign appeared on the site, which seemed amazingly quick for the agent to have done all his due diligence to get a sale sign on them. From that period on, I started to have grave reservations about what was being presented in front of us. But the problem is, we've lost trust in the council. I have lost trust, and that's what it boils down to. They lost trust, and they complained a lot. Allegations were made about the conduct of the council leader and his deputy. 
an independent inquiry report costing £25,000 was commissioned. 11000 was spent on a police inquiry. It completely cleared the councillors, but didn't satisfy the rebels, who still feel documents are kept from them. When we're told we cannot see minutes to meetings, when we can't see certain documents, uh, that, raise, that raises alarm bells. And um, no one has given us uh, strong reasons why we can't see these documents. All the minutes that have, they've asked for, have been, all the information they've asked for, has been given to them. Um, I've just met with you before this uh, interview. I'm not taking any minutes of it. Sometimes you meet with people and they aren't there. They have the thought there is something wrong and they are frantically trying to see if they can find it. The simple fact is there's nothing there for them to find. Their claim of a four million black hole in council accounts, unbelievable. Not a single bit of proof has been offered. We've challenged them. I've challenged them twice at council meetings to come up with the proof on that particular subject. Other councillors have challenged them since. They've refused to answer. That's where we are with that group of councillors. What happened here in the summer of 2012 has had serious repercussions. A senior director was suspended. He was escorted from the building by the chief executive. He went home and hanged himself. The inquest verdict, suicide. The director's sister and father sought help from the rebel councillors. They want to know why he was facing disciplinary action. All the inquest heard was it was nothing criminal. His death was tragic. Um, we've supplied all the information to the police and to the coroner. They held a, a inquest. After that inquest, the next of kin, which uh, is his wife, asked that we divulge no further information. We have honoured that commitment. If the council see fit to talk to one side of the family, then surely they should, and nothing to do with us, but they should be able to talk to the blood relatives and, uh, and satisfy them in the same way. The problem is the council's chief executive wants no more questions on the suicide. She went to the police and they sent the three rebels a warning letter about harassment. <laughs> It did seem a tad on the heavy-handed side, and the sorts of things that were being discussed in it, um, breaches of the law and possible uh, prosecution, um, would have anybody receiving a letter like that in no doubt that they were in very serious territory. You're out your baggers, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking about the cost. Yeah. What the letter did do is drive them into the welcoming arms of UKIP. It's another switch for Nick Wainwright, who had begun his political career in local government as part of the ruling Tory group's cabinet. I became disenchanted uh, with what, uh, the, the lack of detail that seemed to be presented when it came to specific projects. And I decided the best thing for me to do was to actually stand as an independent, which would allow me to do my job. In a reversal of fortune, Terry King, now Tory deputy leader, was once an independent colleague of Dave Richardson, one of the three rebels. He still continues from the outside to take the same stance. I want to serve the community. I don't want to be, totally be complaining about what goes on. That gets us nowhere. I want to build, not knock down. The council's chief executive wouldn't be interviewed for this programme. The council have backed her to take legal action against the rebel three, despite criticism at government level. It is my understanding that no apology is forthcoming and that we are at a position to go to the next stage towards legal proceedings. Those on the receiving end of all of that questioning must recognise that's what the other group of members is there to do. Those members who are on the receiving end of decisions they don't like must also realise that's what those decision-making councillors are there to do. Where will this standoff end? They both have solutions far apart. The only way it will be correctly resolved is that um, an independent team of investigators come in and question both, both sides. Bring it to full council in public and say, we believe X is the case because of this. Then we can actually, in public, say this is the answer. Then people can form their own, their own judgments. How far can you go and who blinks first? 
somebody makes the decision that these relationships have to be repaired for the benefit of not just the council, but the people of Rutland as well. High noon could have to wait until the next election in 2015. A year and a half is a very long time in local politics.